Welcome to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA players, legends, and top instructors share their stories, insights, and playing lessons. Join Chris every Tuesday night as he talks with the greats of the game. Tonight's show is sponsored by the French Lick Resort, the PGA Tour Superstore, Taylor Made Golf, the Bobby Jones Apparel Company, Two Under. Welcome to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA players, legends, and top instructors share their stories, insights, and playing lessons. Join Chris every Tuesday night as he talks with the greats of the game. Tonight's show is sponsored by the French Lick Resort, the PGA Tour Superstore, Taylor Made Golf, the Bobby Jones Apparel Company, Two Under, Ben Hogan Golf, Golf Pride, Srixon and their Z-Star Golf Balls, and the Sandiston Resort. Now here is your host, Chris Mascaro. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining me tonight on an Open Championship Week edition of Next on the Tee. It certainly is great having you with me. Tonight, like every week, we're going to give you some playing lessons to help you get to whatever it is the next level of your game is. We'll talk about how to fix your slice, right? You know, for all, for so many of us, that's a big problem, particularly off the tee. Plus, we'll talk short game and get some putting tips as well. We're also going to go inside the ropes of the PGA Tour since it is Open Championship Week. One of my guests tonight played in a couple of those, so we'll definitely hear those stories. So we've got a lot of great information and stories coming your way tonight. My first guest is going to be Chris Sheehan. Chris is the head golf pro at Lebanon Country Club up in Lebanon, uh, Pennsylvania. So all of you in the central part of Pennsylvania, he's your guy, right? you got to go see him, get the help with your game that you need. Chris has also been a club pro at places like Oak Hill, Inverness, Binghorn Golf Club, among many others. He's also been the president of the Southwest Florida chapter of the PGA Professionals. So a lot of great achievements, a lot of great experiences that Chris has. We're going to talk about all of that. We'll talk about the Lebanon Country Club, which was designed by Alexander Finlay, who is, you know, many people talk about being the father of American golf because he's got a number of great golf courses that he's designed going all the way back to the 1800s. It's, uh, you know, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic golf course. We're going to talk about that, get Chris's thoughts on the Open Championship, plus his memories from being at places like Oak Hill. So really looking forward to having him back with me again tonight. He'll join me in just a few minutes. Following him, I'm going to get a return visit from one of the top teachers in the state of Texas, and that's Andy Trainer. Andy is a Level 3 Plain Truth Certified Instructor, plus a TrackMan Master Professional. We'll talk about all of those things and what it means to be a plain truth certified instructor. We'll also talk about how you marry kind of that with the, with the track man data, right? And all that data that comes out of that. So how do you marry that with our golf swings to make a, a, a kind of a dual package and get us to where we need to be? He also works with a, a guy by the name of Chris O'Connell, who is a teacher for players like Matt Kuchar and Hunter Mahan out on the PGA tour, plus a young lady who you're going to be hearing a lot about in the coming years. Uh, she's one of the top ranked amateurs right now and that's alexa pano so uh she's currently ranked 39th on the uh on the uh amateur world ranking so she's a fantastic young player so we'll talk about all of those things and a whole lot more when andy joins me at the bottom of the hour then we're going to round out tonight's show with a return visit from pga tour pro ted purdy ted stared down tiger a couple of times when they were both in college ted played at the university of arizona when tiger was there at stanford so we'll hear a couple of those stories Ted played on the played in the Open Championship back in 2005 and 2006, so we'll get his perspective and what it's like to be a part of an Open Championship. Plus, how do you stay focused in a major, right? That's hard enough. But then when you've got the weather issues that we see so often times in an Open Championship, right? The wind, the rain, the sideways rain. How do you stay focused on all of those sorts of things and play an Open Championship? Well, we'll hear what Ted has to say. He'll join me about 45 minutes from now. So there you have it, folks. As always, more great stories and information and playing lessons coming your way tonight on this edition of Next on the T. And thank you so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me tonight. But before we get started, you know, I always like to kick off the show by reminding you about my friends Mitch and Matthew Lawrence and their great golf shows. Mitch's show is called Talking Golf Getaways. He and his co-host, Darren Bunch, they let you know about great places to go out and play, stay, and even eat and drink while you're there. You can stream their podcast. By going to Golf Trip X, and that's a letter X, so GolfTripX.com. It's also available on great sites like Audio Boom, Stitcher, and Player.fm. Go there, check out their show, and lo- learn about some of the hidden gems that we have around the country. His twin brother, Matthew, also has a great show. It's called Backspin Golf. It airs Sunday mornings from 8 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. You can find it 
on WLXG ESPN Radio AM 1300 up in Lexington, Kentucky. You can also stream it online at WLXG.com. The show's fantastic because Matthew's fantastic, and he has a lot of great guests as well. He makes the show so much fun. Again, it's called Backspin Golf, and you can stream it online by going to WLXG.com or do what I did, which is download the WLXG app. And, folks, as you know, we are sponsored by the French Lick Resort. Let's hear from Steve Rondonero about what's going on up there this summer. It's a Pete Dye masterpiece, the Pete Dye course at French Lick Resort. Pete says its location on one of the highest points in Indiana makes it special. The long views, you can see many 20 and 30 miles from many of the fairways and many of the tees and greens, and, and you can see it in 360 degrees. Donald Ross's hill course put French Lick on the golf map more than 100 years ago. It's where Walter Hagen won the 1924 PGA Championship and the place where today's Symmetra Tour ladies battle each year. It's the ambience around it that makes the golf course. Combine our many resort amenities with legendary golf, and you have a getaway like no other. French Lick Resort is the home of the Senior LPGA Championship, won in 2018 by World Golf Hall of Famer Laura Davies. Play the course's champions play. Plan your trip now, online at FrenchLick.com. Yeah, folks, it's a fantastic place. And again, not only do you get great golf, but oh, by the way, guess what? They got a casino on the property for you as well. Go online to FrenchLake.com to see for yourself what a wonderful place it is and to book your stay as well. And folks, well, TaylorMade has done it again. Their M5 and M6 drivers are both tremendous. They both feature speed injected twist face created through a revolutionary manufacturing process where every single head, and folks, I do mean every single head. You heard David Abeles, their CEO, talk about it. They are each injected and calibrated to the threshold of the legal limit. So basically, every head is made tour spicy. So speed for all of us. Check it out online by going to TaylorMadeGolf.com. Please also check out our friends at the Bobby Jones Apparel Company by going online to bobbyjones.com. They've got their semi-annual sales event going on right now. Savings of up to 50 to 60% off of some, some items. In fact, their best-selling performance polo shirts are up to 60% off right now. Check it out online by going to bobbyjones.com. All right, now back in making his fifth appearance with me here on the French Lick Resort guest line is Chris Sheehan. Let me remind you a little bit about Chris's background. He's from Warwick, Rhode Island. He attended Trinity College over in Hartford, Connecticut, where he was the captain of the baseball and hockey teams and was an all-region and all-American nominee in both sports. In golf, Chris won the 2003 Western New York PGA Section Assistant Professional Championship and tied for 38th at the TaylorMade Adidas National Assistant Professional Championship that same year. Spent six seasons working alongside three of Golf Digest Top 100 instructors, including Bill and Craig Harmon, plus uh, Todd Stones as well. 2009, Chris was the PGA South Florida Section's Private Club Merchandiser of the Year. He's been a PGA professional since 1999 and worked at clubs like Bighorn Golf Club, Oak Hill Country Club, Inverness, Tuscany Reserve Golf Club, Getaway Golf and Country Club, and Pelican's Nest Golf Club. And like I said in the at the top of the show, he is now the head golf professional at Lebanon Country Club up in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. He's also been the president of the Southwestern Florida Chapter of PGA Professionals, and I'm very excited. He is back with me again tonight here on Next on the T. Hey, Chris, thanks for coming back on the show. Oh, it's always a pleasure. I appreciate the invitation. It's great to be with you. So, Chris, catch us up. What's been going on with you so far this year? Well, we, we've had a we've had a good year so far. It's not raining, <laughs> so um, you know, 2018 was a little bit of a curse for uh, for Pennsylvania and in the area, um, and places like us at Lebanon and you know Hershey Country Club and, and the whole area. We had I think 90 inches of rain that started wow. in early July and went all the way t- to the fall. You know, we 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 were. You know, Dan Brickley, our, our, our maintenance, uh, our superintendent, uh, did a great job just keeping us open. We were playing par fours and par as par threes and rerouting people from the first tee through the range to the first hole. But, uh, this year has been great. The weather's been nice. Obviously we're in a nice little hot spell right now. So that poses other challenges to the superintendents of the country. Um, but so far so good. Uh, the club's buzzing. You know, we're, we're adding new members. We're getting younger. The junior program is still thriving, um, 
We've got our big national better ball coming up. The, the Sullivan is next week. It's a four-day event. We draw players, teams from 10 to 15 states that come up and play a 74-year-old event, uh, a, a four-day better ball event. So everything's cooking right now. Uh, we're glad to have good weather. We're glad to have a sort of a rebound year, and and uh, we still got a lot of golf left this summer. And, Chris, for those who aren't as familiar with Lebanon Country Club, again, it's an Alexander Finley design who many people credit with being the founder of American Golf. Talk about your golf course itself and its history as well. Yeah, the golf course is fantastic. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, we're celebrating our centennial year next year in 2020. We've been around for a hundred years, but it has been, uh, and increasingly, uh, so in, 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 in recent years, it's been sort of the darling of the Penn, Pennsylvania State Golf Association as far as hosting big time events. We, we've had, uh, we had the state senior better ball this year. We've got the ladies. All three ladies championships next year. Uh, we had the senior match play two, two years ago. It always hosts, uh, you know, an open qualifier. It's just a great golf course that maxes out at 6,400 yards. Um, it, it's raised great players that have played division one golf and gone on to the PGA tour like Greg Lesher and Blaine Peffley and division one golfers at Vanderbilt, like, you know, Chris Gebhardt it, and who's won the last two Sullivans, uh, it just is one of those places where you have to move the ball right to left off the tee and left to right off the tee. It's got long fours, short short par fours, uh, long threes, short threes, uh, gettable par fives, unreachable par fives. And the greens are tiny. You know, it, they're old push-up greens. Some of them are, are probably 80 years old. And you got to learn how to chip and putt. So it creates a ton of great short game guys. We just finished our club championship last week where the guy who won, rightfully so, he missed one green in the first 18 holes of a 36 wow. hole final and just, uh, yeah, and made some putts. So you obviously have to put it in play, but you gotta, you gotta put it on the greens. You always have chances for birdies when you do hit the greens because they are that small and, uh, you know, they're undulating when they need to be and they're flat when they need to be. Uh, just very well done. It's, it's an amazing piece of property. Um, it's just an amazing place and it's raised a lot of great golfers and we're trying to, we're trying to, uh, you know, forge ahead with, with the juniors here and, and, and create another, uh, generation of, of not necessarily great, great golfers, but just great lovers of the game. And, uh, you know, that's my job as the club professional is just create love affairs with these kids and, and the game. And, and then all of a sudden they, they follow in their dad's footsteps and they join. And when they have kids, their kids play and then they join. And, and that's how clubs last a hundred years. You have to have a good steward of the game and a good club pro that, that really stresses, uh, you know, not necessarily being good at it, but just loving it. And, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. So it's, it's a, it's a great place. It's a fantastic place. It's really, it's one of the neatest places in the middle of kind of nowhere. And uh, it's just awesome. And, and the Pennsylvania State Golf Association keeps rewarding us with great events. And we're happy to host. And it's good for good for, for men, for seniors, for ladies. And uh, as our kids are finding out, it's fun to play for them as well. And, Chris, with, with Finley being Scottish, is it a link-style golf course with that kind of terrain, or is it a more traditional American course that we're all used to seeing? No, it's very Parkland. You know, you've got the front nine on one hand. It's it's a perfect. It's almost a symmetrical. Um, it's almost a, a symmetrical property where the front hand, where the first nine is on one half and the the back nine is on the other half, and each nine actually pitches toward the center of the property for drainage. Um, it it's tree lined. Uh, obviously, you know, Pennsylvania and this area is going through some some tree disease. So you know, we still have thousands of trees, but um it's it's very it's very old school classical uh you know move it left to right everything's tree lined there's nothing linksy about it um but you certainly have plenty of of choices when you're hitting approaches you know there there's not a lot of front green bunkers that you need to carry over you can always hit that little punch shot through the through the gap of the left front bunker and the right front bunker so it's not a it's not an an air attack sort of golf course. It's something where you have choices, and when you have wedges, you can go at it. And when you when you have longer approaches, you can you can run it through the center of the green, 
it's got some greens that are on hills that you can play high to, you play low to as well. And uh, it just has a lot of choices, which I think, you know, architects of his era uh, gave you those choices because of that, that European influence. Um, which is really fun. And it's one of the reasons why people who say it, we just had the, the state seniors and we had folks from Oakmont and Aronimink and, you know, making their first visit to the, to the facility and said, man, I could play this every day. And it's one of the, it's one of the neat things about the club is that you never get bored. Um, it's tight and it's, and it's tough and the greens are small, but it's not too long. So you have options of, of where you can let it out or where you can lay back. And then you have choices coming into the greens as well. And Chris, you've talked about juniors here. You mentioned juniors a couple of times for, for the people in the central Pennsylvania area, talk about the programs that you offer for junior golfers and uh, adult players as well. Yeah. The juniors has really been, as you and I've talked, you know, uh, it's really been, you know, sort of the highlight of my, of my existence at the club. When I got there, we had, we had eight kids sign up for junior golf in 2017, and last year we saw more. We saw more than 80 kids come through the program. Um, wow! We're just making it fun, you know, and we're creating, uh, you know, a basic approach to the game. Um, it's very young, you know. I, I have a gap of ages, you know. I don't have many of the 10 to 15 year olds. Um, so we run two age groups sort of a 10 and under and an 11 and up. And, and it's about 50 kids in the young group and about 20, 20 to 30 in the older group. And, uh, you know, the younger kids were trying to make it fun today. We were sort of lightening out. We were in the ballroom tonight. So we were doing some chipping and pitching in the ballroom. And um, we, we had a little contest where they had to chip it into my baseball glove. And if they got five in the last 10 minutes, they all got ice cream. And so that was exciting for them. It's not that, uh, you know, rain is a deterrent to having fun. You can do it in your house. You can do it indoors. And that was something that, that I hope that they, they took with them tonight. But the older kids were working on getting them on the golf course. You know, there's, there, there's, there's something about learning how to play, but, uh, learning how to swing and learning how to chip and learning how to putt. But the, mo- the most important thing uh, for me this year with my older kids is, is getting them out on the golf course. And I, I had a, I had a, a lesson the other day with a, with a younger, probably a nine or 10 year old kid. And I said, look, my goal for you at the end of these three weeks is to get you to go up to your dad in the house and say, dad, let's go play golf. And so we focus on, you know, how to play, where to stand, how to fix ball marks, rake bunkers, you know, the the technical stuff will come and they're all growing and their bodies are changing and they'll have a general understanding of what they're supposed to do. Um, But my goal is to create golfers uh, is, is to really, to really stress that you can do this, uh, no matter how good or, or good you are. Um, but go ahead and tell, you know, grab your dad or your mom. Say, hey, mom, let's go play nine. Or, hey, mom, let's go play three. Or, hey, mom, let's go play, uh, you know, let's go play a little scramble. Or, let's go play an alternate shot. And just to get them to the club. And, you know, it's kind of my job as a club professional is to promote the game, but also to promote their activity at the club and, and get them out there as much as, as they can. Um, I've always taken the opinion that, you know, the, the the folks that play two times a week, if I get them there a third time, that's a bonus. And the folks that play three times a week, if I get them there a fourth time, that's a bonus. And um, if it normally, if you allocate four hours for your golf game, but I can say, you know, how about come hit balls for 30 minutes and how about come stay for a, you know, a Coke and, and some and some fries after that promotes the club. And, and I've always tried to, to sort of expand upon uh, that with my staff is, you know, let's get them here, but let's get them here one more time a week and let's get them here one more hour every time they come. And, uh, and that's how clubs become successful. So I'm happy to be in that role. Chris, let's switch gears a little bit. And uh, you spent three years out at Oak Hill, one of the most prestigious golf courses that we have in the country, our good friend here on the show, Sean McKeel, won the 2003 PGA Championship there. We've seen guys like Jack Nicklaus and Lee Trevino, Jason Duffner all win majors out at Oak Hill. So I uh, just wanted to get a couple of a quick thoughts from you about your time there and maybe some of the, the great uh, legends or some stories that you heard while you were a part of that golf club. Yeah, I was, you know, for someone who didn't grow up playing golf and uh, getting into the game, the way that I did, it was really a, especially 
boy, what am I now? I'm probably, I'm almost 16 years uh, gone from Oak Hill, um, which is an amazing thing. I think <laughs> you said I started being a club pro in 1999. I'm trying to think of where 20 years went, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know, Oak Hill is just one of those, it's one of those places. It's just, um, it, uh, when you set foot on the property, when you pull in the driveway, you just have this feeling that, that it is, it is just, um, it's just a magical place. And you know, walking around the clubhouse and, and being in the, in, you know, in the, in the golf shop and, and in the, the men's locker room and seeing the plaques and the, the testimonies that, that they have on, on their website and just, uh, how good the golf course was and playing it hundreds of times and just, you know, being, you know, at the point of, of submission because it's just such a fair, hard golf course and learning how to play for me, really. I mean, I was, I was probably, I was only in the golf business for maybe two or three years before I started working there. So that's really where I learned how to play, so to speak. And, you know, the membership, it just being so uh, embracing of the history of the game and the history of major championships and at the same time trying to, you know, play 40,000 rounds a year and, and understanding how special of a place it was. And, and, you know, they're going through some changes now with the golf course and, um, you know, the modern, you know, the modern tree cutting and all of that stuff. And I was there briefly for about a day. I think it was last winter and, and, you know, they've cut a lot of trees down. It's a different appearance. And you saw the senior open there this year. I think it was a senior open and, you know, it's a different look. Um, but it's still, you know, as Ross designed it, everything's in front of you and you still got to hit the shots. And, um, it's just an amazing place. Uh, you know, privileged to work there. I was privileged to work at Inverness, which is coming up with a, with a championship soon. And, um, it, places like that, it, the one thing that always caught my eye was, was just how, um, how giving the membership was. I mean, when the, when the, when the volunteer ballots came out, it was sold out in, you know, in, in a day or two. And they just, they embraced the game so hard and they love their facility so much. And at the end of the week of a major championship to, to see what they've pulled off you know, that they started planning three years in advance was just, you know, it was, it was honestly, it was awe inspiring that what the, what these folks do and, and what it means to the area, what it means to Rochester golf and what it means to any place that hosts a major where you have a private club that closes their doors to their members for a week or two or three and says, you know what, come see what we have here. We're really proud to have you. And there's no futzing about it. They just, they embrace the players, they embrace the history, they embrace everything. And I love that about Oak Hill. You never heard anything about, oh, we got another major coming up. You know, it was just like, you know, we got a major. Let's let's get involved. And I love that. So one of my favorite things about working at places like that is, is just it was never about anything other than this is who we are and we're going to show you how good we can do this. And I love that about it. Chris, a couple more before I let you go. And, and I want to get a couple of playing lessons for our listeners. and. And I want to sure. start by, you know, getting your advice for how we can stop the dreaded slice off the tee. If, we, if we're a banana slicer off the tee, what are some things that we can do? What are some drills that we can do to fix that? Well, if you look at slicers generally, um, and you know me, I'm a baseball player, so I tend to equate a lot of things in golf, uh, which is a contact sport to a lot of things in baseball, which – uh, obviously, it's hitting the baseball is a contact sport, but throwing the baseball is also uh, very relative to the golf swing. Most most slicers of the ball swing high to high, so their 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 take their back swing is very vertical. Their left arm sort of comes up, and they you know sort of bisects their right shoulder and their chin, and the follow through is very vertical. Somehow, some way in the history of time, somebody told somebody to swing to the target. Um, so the, so the follow through is always at the hole rather than around your body. And, uh, if you swing a club that runs vertical to vertical, the ball is going to slice no matter what. It's just the way it is. So if you take a baseball pitcher and you give him a curveball hold and you release it from over your head, the ball is going to break down. But if you give him that same grip on a baseball and release it from the side of your hip, the ball, the ball will, cro- will curve across your body. And so the point of release of the baseball pitcher's curveball whether it's at 12 o'clock or at nine o'clock the ball spins differently and so golfers need to take that same sort of approach to swinging the golf club if you release it from 12 o'clock 
you're always going to follow through to upwards. So you're always going to swing it. You're always going to slice it. So what I try and get my players to do is to swing more around their waist. And a lower swing plane that follows through at a lower swing plane will completely reverse the spin of a slice. And so if you think about uh, taking the club back sort of high versus taking the club back around your waist, you're going to be given the incentive to release it around your waist or you're going to be given the incentive to release it at the target because no one who swings it back vertically wants to swing to the left. But the golf club, for since the history of time, is manufactured on an angle, which tells you it should go in a circle. And most slicers defy that science and swing it vertically up and vertically up on the up on the backswing and the follow through, and they're going to get a slice no matter what they do. I mean, you can give someone a stronger grip, but if they still swing it vertically, instead of them slicing it, they'll hit low hooks. And so, when when I work with students, what I try and work on is the shape of the swing, not necessarily the grip or you know pulling the right foot back or trying to get a ham sandwich grip so that the club releases. I, I, I'm really a proponent of a very neutral grip, but just changing where the club comes from, which will dictate where the club goes to. And if you swing it high, you'll finish high. If you swing it low, you'll finish low. And I think when you do those two things, you'll see a drastic reversal of spin of the golf ball. And so someone with an average swing with a, but a, a very good setup, a very good aim, and very good alignment, and very good posture, and very good ball position, you take all those pre-shot things out of the way, uh, you can hit any curve of the ball based on where you where it comes from, and I always equate that to a baseball pitcher and his variety of cutters and sliders and 12 to 6 curve balls. Where it comes from dictates where it will finish, and that dictates where the ball will spin. Chris, one more before I let you go. And um, when you're when you're teaching your whether it's your junior or your adult students, one of the things that uh, my buddies and I struggle with is reading putts. We either overread or underread putts, and uh, so oftentimes we'll talk about how, well, I can't believe it broke that bar. I can't believe it broke that way. When you're teaching your students how to read greens, what are some fundamentals that can help us be better readers of the green? Well, uh, it's a great question. It's a really hard question, uh, only because most players, for me in particular, I'm a very soft speed putter, so I tend to play more break. If you're someone who tends to hit it firmer, you have to understand that, you know, uh, there's less break. And in any putt, there's always more break when the, when the putt is slowing down. So, uh, I, I tend to die, try and die my putts in, into the hole. So I'm, I play more break. Uh, I have an assistant who's a phenomenal player who, uh, who plays everything so firm that w- we were at the state, uh, pro assistant in New Jersey last week. And we're on the third hole, and he's like, I like this. And I said, I am so far outside that, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and so uh, it's just a totally different thing. You're playing a team event. We've never played a team event before. And, you know, he's looking at, at, at a cup, and I'm looking at a foot. And so you have to understand what kind of putter you are, first of all. If you're an aggressive type putter who, who tends to hit firmer, and, and if you miss, you got three or four feet. I don't ever want to see a three or four footer for the rest of my life. So I'm looking at six inches. Whether I make or miss, I don't care. Um, but so that that's the first determination of how much break you should play is find out what kind of putter you are. Are you a defensive putter like me or are you an aggressive putter like the 30-year-old assistant I have who never misses? And you just say, you know what, this is who I'm going to be. But, you know, the old adage is, you know, stand on top of the hole and pour a bucket of water and where does the water fall? And how fast would that water fall in that direction, you know? It sort of tells you uh, the general break of the green. Uh, he's into the new sort of putting uh, reading where he, he goes halfway through uh, up his putt and he puts, you know, he, he side saddles the, the putt and he's trying to figure out the break. I'm just a, uh, where's this water going and how how close can I get this to dying in the hole? So, you know, first and foremost, find out what kind of putter you are. Everybody's different. Um, you know, if you're nervous out there, if you're aggressive out there, uh, it's going to change. But if you tend to have your pace of your putt on the slower side, play more. And if you tend to have the pace of your putt on the faster side, certainly play less. Chris, I can't let you go without getting uh, your pick for the Open Championship this week. Who do you like? Who do you think oh. is at the top of the leaderboard come Sunday? Woo, that's a good question. You know, British Opens are, are diff- you know are difficult. Um, other than Ben Curtis in you know, 03, you know, it, it seems to be everybody with experience, whether it's a lot of tour experience, a lot of years of experience, or a lot of European-style play experience wins these things. 
Um, you know, uh, oh boy, I, you know, you just saw Nicholson this week said he's not even close. Haven't heard a lot from Molinari this week. Spieth is on the mend. Um, you know, you look at the last four or five Molinari, Spieth, uh, Stenson, Johnson, McElroy. Um, it's cool to see Darren Clark hitting the first tee shot in his hometown. You got some hot players, Bern Wiesberger, Matthew Fitzpatrick, Cantley's a can't miss kid. I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to take Rory. All right. Got a lot of pressure being in it, essentially his hometown. So it'd be interesting to see how yeah. he deals with that. But he would certainly be a popular win. Yes, Chris, remind would. our listeners how they can follow you both online and on social media. Well, I'm on Twitter at L-E-B-C-C Pro. Uh, L-E-B-C-C Pro. And um, you follow me on Facebook, Christian Sheehan. And the Country Club's website is lebcc.com. And uh, we got a new website rolling out this year, kind of working through that as, as we go through the summer. Um, but uh, you can find me anywhere. Central Pennsylvania is a great place to be. It's a great golfing uh, area. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be at Lebanon Country Club and a pleasure to grow the game the best I can. Chris, it's always a good time having you as part of the show. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come back and join me again tonight. I hope you'll come back and join me again real soon, my friend. It's always a pleasure having you here. Uh, you know me. I, I will always say yes to you, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say, and uh, you know, you are awesome in what you do, and everybody who you talk to and every all of your guests say the same thing. You're just uh, so prepared and and so great at it, and and me as a golf professional appreciate everything you do to, to help us grow this game and the game you love and and I love, and uh, I'm so thankful uh, to have this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I appreciate that very very much, Chris. Take care, my friend. All the best to you and your family. Look forward to catching up with you again real soon. I look forward to it. Thank you, Chris. You bet. Take care, Chris. That's Chris Sheehan, and S H E E H A N is uh, the spelling of his last name. Again, he's up at Lebanon Country Club in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, doing a great job there, growing the game. You heard it, right? Junior program only had a handful of kids, and now he's got you know 50 or 60 of them as a part of that. So uh, he's doing such a fantastic job up there, growing our game and being a part of that country club. And again, historic country club. You heard him. It's going to be uh, celebrating their uh, centennial anniversary next year. So really looking forward to having uh, Chris as we run up to that for next year. And what a wonderful golf club uh, it looks at. It looks like. Take a look at it online. What a wonderful design it is. And uh, certainly look forward to having Chris back on the show again real soon. All right. Before I get to my next guest, Andy Trainer, I want to remind you about our good friends over at the Ben Hogan Golf Equipment Company. Now, folks, if you haven't hit Ben Hogan Irons since maybe the 80s or the 90s, do yourself a favor. They've got a demo iron program where they'll send you one so you can check it out and compare it to whatever it is you have. So you can check out their Fort Worth PTX, the new PTX Pro irons, which are fantastic. They're edge irons as well. And you can take those out, compare it to whatever it is you've got. All of their irons and wedges are handcrafted one at a time in their Fort Worth, Texas factory. So there's no mass production, no shortcuts. You can order custom-made irons, wedges, and hybrids by going online to BenHoganGolf.com. And again, they're going to build those clubs to your specification. And oh, oh, by the way, best of all, charge you a fraction of the typical retail price. So check out their complete line of forged irons, wedges, utility irons, hybrids, bags, accessories, and their new GS53 driver and fairway woods. Look fantastic. Go online to BenHoganGolf.com and check them out for yourself. All right, folks. Now back and joining me here on the French Lick Resort guest line is Andy Trainer. Let me give you a little bit of background on Andy. He is a Level 3 Plain Truth Certified Instructor and a Trackman Master Professional at Plain Truth Golf Academy down at the courses at Waters, uh, Waters Creek in Plano, Texas. He coaches one of the top 30 women amateur players ranked in the country. He works alongside Chris O'Connell, who happens to coach Matt Kuchar, Hunter Mahan, Gavin Green, and uh, my next guest, Ted Purdy. And, uh, you know, Andy's done a fantastic job. He's been a great guest over the years. Can't thank him enough for his time and coming back and joining me again tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Andy, how are you, my friend? Hey, Chris, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm good, thank you. Um, up in New York at the moment, my daughter and her husband are over from uh, from Europe where they live in Italy. Um, so uh, if there's any background noise, I apologize because I've just walked out of the restaurant <laughs> and, um, and I'm standing outside. I'll, I'll try to keep this as, as as quiet as I can. 
<laughs> I appreciate the effort, Andy. So it's been a little while, my friend. Uh, haven't had an opportunity to catch up so far this year. Catch us up. What's been going on with you this year? Uh, same, same old, same old, Chris. Um, working with uh, players from um, from complete beginners through to some of the the very best players out there, um, and enjoying every every moment of it. I'm so thankful to work at, at Plain Truth Golf Academy in Dallas uh, with my colleagues there, uh, Chris O'Connell, Jake Sandusky, and, and Joe Brown. And Andy, as I mentioned a moment ago, you're a level three Plain Truth certified instructor. Talk about what Plain Truth is and what the teaching process is all about. So Plain Truth um, was, was started basically by Jim Hardy and Chris O'Connell. Jim Hardy has been a is is a Hall of Fame uh instructor. Most I mean the best instructor I've ever seen. I mean, sometimes I think that I'm good and then then I see what Jim does and, and then it's when I think I'm not so good. Um but Jim um first wrote his book I think back in early part of the century. Um that sounds a long time ago now, doesn't it? That's terrible to say that. But um Plain Truth for Golfers where he basically identified their uh, Two types of golf swing, a one plane golf swing and a two plane golf swing. Um, groundbreaking book at the time, still fantastic. And then from there, um, Jim and Chris started doing instructor certifications, uh, for anyone who, who wanted to, to understand what they were doing. Um, plain truth golf is all about, uh, improving impact and ball flight. Um, so although people think that we are teaching one and two plane golf swings, we are, we're working around that, but we're improving um, impact and ball flight for every person that stands in front of us. We don't believe that you should get worse to get better. We think that if you can understand impact, then go ahead and improve that impact and subsequently the ball flight as a result of that, that person should get better. Plain truth motto is hit the next ball better. Um, and that's hit the next ball better. Not hit the next ball perfect, hit the next ball better. Um, you know, if, if I was learning to play, let's say the piano, and I could go in, in for my piano lesson and, and I could play chopsticks. I wouldn't expect to walk out not being able to play chopsticks. I would kind of expect to, to play a little bit better than, than when I went in. And, and so for so long, golf instruction, um, has been about swing shape. Um, it will get better later on. Just keep doing this, get, keep doing that. And, you know, it, it should get better immediately. If, if you can understand the impact in the ball flight, you should be able to make somebody better immediately and andy you're also a trackman master professional how do you take the trackman data and then sort of marry it up with the plain truth you know and then the process that you're going there to help people with their swing how do you marry up both of those things so that uh, students understand better not only what i need to improve on but what i need to focus on when i'm either playing or out on the practice range well where trackman has been so um, useful is it making people understand what actually happens in a ball flight. So um, where, if you like, the um, the contact point of the golf ball is, and then the um, the path relative to that contact point. And so you know, once you completely understand um, the, if you like, the the intricacies of uh, contact and and basically um the where the club is moving in 3D relative to that concept right now you can start to understand w what's happening in a golf swing and so without understanding ball flight you can completely understand how to bring about change um and so when i was playing golf i, I didn't have the right ideas about why i i was hitting a golf shot and so when i Stop playing golf. I, I wanted to know, hey, was it me that just wasn't very good? Or was it the fact that, you know, I, I, what I was being told wasn't correct? And so I went out and, um, just talked to as many people as I can. And, and kind of two things stood out for me. Um, was track man when they could explain how a ball flies, why it flies that way. And, um, obviously through Frederick Tuxen's work, but, Probably even more important than that was, was meeting Jim Hardy and Chris O'Connell. Um, they kind of blew me away, um, just by answering some of my questions. And so I would, I mean, I was, uh, back in England at that time. And, um, so I would come over to the States as, as much as I can, uh, as much as I could just to, to keep, 
basically getting everything I could from those two guys. And, and then subsequently, I, uh, Chris asked me to come and work with him uh, in Dallas, and uh, it's been great. And speaking of Chris, Andy, you know, he, he works with guys like Matt Kuchar and Hunter Mahan, Gavin Green, a rising star on the women's amateur side, Alexa Pano, who we've gotten to know a little bit on this show, plus my next guest up, uh, Ted Purdy. So talk about what it's like working with Chris and being around guys like that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, Chris is a, a, a great guy. We are incredibly good friends. Um, and that's the, the, the first thing. And I think that we kind of bounce off each other a little bit. Some of the stuff that, that I bring to the table and, and then obviously everything that Chris brings to the table as well. And, and, and from that, from there, we can really start to, to, to help people, um, really get, I mean, improve their game to the next level. And, and no matter what level they're at, um, if you think what Chris has done for, for Matt Kuchar's game, Chris started working with Matt, I think it's 2006. Matt was, Matt wasn't on the tour. Um, he was, he'd lost his card at that point. And, and Matt now, you know, he's literally an ATM, isn't he? I mean, he's, I think he's had 90 plus top tens in his, in his career, which is crazy. And, you know, if you think about the people that have had all the top tens in their career, so they must be doing something correct. And they kind of, some of those people have some funny looking golf swings. Jim Furyk, Matt Kuchar, um, I'm just, I mean, feel even trying to think if Dustin Johnson is, is up there now. Um, but you know, some of the things that those people do are kind of some funky things in the golf swing, but they all make great impact and therefore they hit, um, re repetitive, correct golf shots. I've got Ted Purdy coming up with me here in just a couple of minutes. Ted, what, Ted, what have Ted, you Ted, seen about Ted, working with Ted? Ted, Ted might be the nicest person I've, I know. I mean, he, he's just such a great guy. Um, and when Chris, kind of Chris and Ted first got together. Ted was kind of a, uh, it, it, he was off the tour, he lost his card. Um, it maybe um, had some information that, that, that wasn't helping him. Um, and so everything about Ted has just been making him more correct, more repetitive. And uh, Ted, Ted can work incredibly hard. I mean, I, I, first time I ever worked with Chris and Ted just amazed me. I mean, I think we stood on the range for five hours hitting balls because he, he like it was like a kid that's just got this new toy and, and he just didn't want to let it go. And then, me and Chris are looking at each other and going, is this guy, this guy ever going to stop? And he, he just wanted to hit balls so much and Ted is so passionate about getting better and, and as I said, might be the nicest guy you, you, you could ever meet. Great player. Um, it's tough once you come off the tour getting your card or you've lost your card to get back out there. And uh, I mean, if Ted can get back out there Ted, Ted, Ted will do well again because he's, I mean, he sent me a video last night and, and it's, that thing, that thing looks good. You can see the club face is st so stable for impact. And, and he said he's in it good. So it'll be interesting to see how he does. What about Alexa Pano? She's a 14 year old rising star on the women's amateur rankings. I've had the pleasure of talking with her and her father, Rick. Talk about what you're seeing from her game as you're watching her. Well, I mean, one of the things, I mean, and I haven't spent a lot of time around Alexa, but one of the things that, that, that struck me with Alexa is how mature she is. And there's a 14 year old girl that, I mean, you would not believe that, that she's 14 with the questions she asks, with the way that she conducts herself. I mean, this is a girl that obviously you've already seen what she's done and she was, can't obviously been doing well for a long, long time. But, you know, she is now starting to, again, get a very repetitive um, impact, very correct repetitive impact. And uh, I really do feel that, that she is going to go on to big things. And, and, and at this moment in time, I want to give a big shout out to her dad, Rick. I mean, wow. And he keeps that, uh, that girl grounded. I mean, she's a great girl. And, and some, I mean, that's a big shout out for him. Um, he, he really did surprised me and I mean that in the nicest possible way that, that how how he didn't get involved you see some parents out there with their kids and you know they they kind of uh, they, they want to they're, they're almost living their life through their kids and ultimately that that doesn't generally end up well but man 
he, he just amazed me um, and how well he's brought that, that uh, Alexa up and how, how just mature. I mean, you do not believe you're talking to a 14-year-old girl with the questions she asks, the way that she conducts herself. She's going to go far and she's going to have a great career. And you guys are also working with Tony Romo, who just uh, defended his title last weekend at the American Century Championship on the Celebrity Tour. What's it like working with Tony? What a great guy. Um, possibly the hardest working person that I've ever worked with. I mean, you can understand why Tony Romo got to the to the top of of, of football. I mean, I. I Growing up in England, I kind of didn't know much about American football. I still, I mean, I still call it American football, and that's slowly changing. So for everybody that's in the States listening to this, I apologize. It's football. And, um, you know, I, I've stood with, with Tony Romo in, a, in 110 degrees heat, and he's hit balls for four hours. And I've stood with him in 20 degrees, and he's hit balls for four hours. That guy is so passionate about um, getting better. And... And he really is starting to get it. Um, he's one of the few people. I mean, obviously, to, to play two two sports, trying to play in two sports professionally, I mean, that's, I mean that, that doesn't happen many times. And, I mean, obviously, age isn't, isn't on his side. And he's playing catch-up so much. And he understands that. And, I, and, I, and he's just, just trying to see how good he can get. Um, and, but he's getting pretty good. I um, mean, he's played... Two, two events on uh, he's a web event and then uh, the Punta Cana and uh, I mean he, he hasn't performed as, as well as he'd, he'd like in those events he played Dallas this year but he's showing just starting to show w- what he shows um, if you like not when he's playing events and, and he'll I mean he, he'll do well he's just a, such a great guy can't say enough about, about Tony Roma um, incredible guy very good to us Andy, just a couple more before I let you go, and I want to switch gears to get a couple of playing lessons from you, and I want to start with short game. So if we're faced you know, with a shot where we're 100 yards out, no trouble in front, any of that sort of thing, we're just 100 yards out from the green. But talk about just the decision process. Not, I don't want to you know, talk about the club selection as, as much as more of, you know, talk about what, what we should be looking at, what we should be considering before we decide which club to pull out of the bag? Well, the majority of the people that I see playing amateur golf don't understand that the middle of the green is generally a good shot. And so uh, and they feel that they get it to within 100 yards and uh, now they're going to start to aim at the flag. And, you know, they're, they're going to hit shots and very often not give themselves enough room for error. You know, look, there are... To, to hit a golf ball exactly where you want to hit it, it's kind of tough. And if you're playing golf once a week, uh, you're probably best not to, to go ahead and try that. So um, you kind of look at the goal, at the green where the green is, you look where the flag is on that green, and then you kind of start to assess if the flag is at the front. Guess what? You're not playing to the flag. You're playing to the middle of the green. You're going to go past the flag. So you club yourself to the middle of the green. Don't club yourself to the flag. Give yourself if you enough club to go to the middle of the green now. If you nuke it, you go ahead and hit your hit your best shot, career best. It might go five yards longer, and so now um, you're you're back at the green. But if you miss hit it, you're still on the green. You're, you're still, you know, you're not come up in the, whatever the trouble is short. Now it's maybe a different matter if there's no trouble short. You're trying to assess where the trouble is and then hit your shot from there. I mean, I think that if everybody play to the middle of the green, even from a hundred yards, you're going to shoot a better score. Andy, what about when we're a little bit closer to the green and we need to hit a pitch shot, whether it's over a bunker, or over a pond, water, whatever it might be? A lot of times, you know, we get a little handsy, right? We try to scoop the ball, we try to help it up. How how can we do a better job with our setup ball position and hit that shot more crisply? Well, the, the problem when when people talk about scooping, scooping becomes a problem if you scoop the golf club in a straight line. Chris, who was just on talking about, you talked about the uh, the, the club swinging around in, in a somewhat of a circular motion. And that's very correct. And so for the golf club to swing um, to the left, obviously, there has to be some the club swing down and to the right and then back up and to the left. Now, if you're trying to lean that shaft forward to keep the handle 
in front of the club at all the time, you're always going to be swinging down and to the right. You're taking loft off of the golf club, and therefore, you know, what, what, what's the point of using a lofted golf club and now taking loft off of it? Now, if you want to hit a, a lower shot, go ahead and take a, um, like a less lofted golf club. Less lofted golf clubs hit the ball lower because they hit more at the side of the ball. Lower lofted, uh, higher lofted golf clubs uh, hit it higher because they hit more underneath the ball. The contact point is under the equator, whereas 7 iron, 5 iron, you know, you're going to be hitting more at the, the side of the ball. And what the problem is when people play wedges is that they see a lot of loft on a golf club and now they start feeling that they've got to get it um, up and, if you like, the golf club in a vertical motion. The golf club is shorter, makes someone swing more vertical, and so they start to swing more vertical. And then with that loft of the golf club and the vertical golf swing, the golf club has, uh, if you like, too, too narrow a bottom to the golf swing. And so too narrow a bottom a golf swing means that often the pow- person starts plowing into the ground. When you have a lofted golf club, you want to swing that golf club much more around the bo- around the body, so you, you're making that bottom of that golf swing as wide as possible. Now you can go ahead and let the loft of the golf club be the thing that hits underneath the, the equator of the golf ball, not the, if you like, the plane of the golf swing that, that's, or the angle of, of the golf swing that, that's doing that. The loft will do it for you. So you want a more rounded golf swing um, with your wedges than you do a more upright golf swing. Otherwise, you're going to start to... Uh, struggle to to get a good contact, uh, uh, repetitive contact on the golf ball. Andy, before I let you go, remind our listeners about your home course, the courses there at Waters Creek and the facility that you have available there. Yeah, the courses at Waters Creek is uh, it's a great facility. Uh, I think it was voted the number one uh, practice uh, public practice facility in Dallas. Um, we have a, I mean, uh, I think it must be a 50 uh, station uh, grass uh, range. We have a six-hole uh, golf course. We have a nine-hole golf course, and we have an 18-hole golf course. We also have uh, two putting greens, uh, three uh, chipping greens. Um, it's it's a really good facility. Um, the city of Allen um, has, has gone ahead and, and made that a great facility for the people of the area. Andy, let our listeners know as well, how can they stay up to date with all the great things you're doing, whether they're following you online or it's on social media? Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, Plain Truth Golf, uh, sorry, Plain Truth Dallas.com or Plain Truth Golf.com. Um, my Twitter account, uh, is at Trainer Andy and I'm on Facebook and I think Instagram is, uh, A Trainer 2012. Um, and I mean, just before I go, I want to say how great a show that you have i've had some of my very good friends on here uh kevin kevin roman fantastic instructor at mpcc and i know he's been on a lot of times i know he knows you very well and it's great to listen to you to your shows um every week look forward to it um you're gonna have a great conversation with ted following up um with such a good guy <laughs> such a good guy Andy, I can't thank you enough for that comment and for taking time out of uh, away from your your family to to come back and be a part of the show. It's always great having you here. I hope you'll come back much sooner next time. Anytime, Chris. You just say the word and I'll be back on. Pleasure to speak to you as always. Um, happy golfing to obviously all your uh, listeners. Um, keep doing great work on the show. It's fantastic. Thank you, Andy. Take care. All the best to you and your family. We'll catch up soon. You too, Chris. Take care. Thank you. Bye. See ya. That's Andy Trainer. T R A Y N O R is uh is how uh, his last name is spelled. At Trainer 2012 at Trainer Andy on uh, on Twitter. Uh, telling you folks the the great things that Andy is doing with the uh, with the folks that he is working with is absolutely spectacular. And the way that he is taking TrackMan data, the plain truth data, you know, or the process, kind of marrying those two things together. And I tell you what. That last tip, and it's something that we've started to hear more and more on this show for, for those of us like me that are weekend hackers and we're out there playing, the best advice is to swing for, you know, the middle of the green. It's something that I've tried to beat into my own head. Like, look, I'm not good enough to go for the pin. I don't play enough and practice enough to be out there uh, pin hunting, right? Go for the middle of the green if you happen to hit it a little light. You're still on the front of the green. You've happened to hit a little heavy. You're still on the back of the green. But at the end of the day, you're on the green. So we're giving ourselves the opportunity to putt for more birdies and pars than we do 
that's great advice from Andy, and it's something that I am certainly taking to heart in my game. Look forward to having Andy back as part of the show again real soon. All right, before I get to my next guest, Ted Purdy, I want to give a shout out to our friends over at Positive Vibes Golf. Check them out online at PositiveVibesGolf.com and give them a follow on Twitter at P Vibes Golf. Their head covers and putter covers are a very unique way to keep your mind focused on positive thoughts. And, and uh, you know, they're a great training aid for on the course as well because it helps focus your mind back on positive things. It gives you positive images. It reminds you to enjoy today. Right? What, what better way to enjoy the day than out on a golf course with your buddies or your friends or your family as well? So check them out online again, PositiveVibesGolf.com, at PVibesGolf on Twitter. I want to give a shout out to our friends over at Golf Pride. In golf, light grip pressure releases power. Golf Pride engineered a secret that pros know. A larger lower hand encourages lighter pressure. Plus four technology is designed with four additional layers, which reduces tension in the lower hand to generate more power. Play plus four and release the secret pros know. Now available on Tour Velvet, the winningest grip on tour. Grip confidence, grip golf pride. And this segment of the show is sponsored by our friends over at Two Under. I want to remind you about our friends over at Two Under, men's performance briefs, the unofficial underwear of the PGA Tour. Worn by PGA Tour players like Ricky Fowler, David Toms, Jerry Kelly, William McGirt, Jason Kokrak, and Matt Everett, to name just a few. Your buddies are going to think you're a stud if they're even seeing you in your underwear, which is another story. And your girlfriend and her wife is going to love the side effects, a visibly enhanced profile. The Joey Pouch technology provides the ultimate male asset management. It separates a man's most valuable assets from bodily contact to reduce unwanted skin-on-skin contact, providing less chafing, more control, and an altogether more luxurious feel. Start every round two under by wearing the coolest performance briefs on the market. Use code on the T20 to save 20% off your order at two under.com. And that's the number two U N D R.com. All right. Now back with me here on the French Lick Resort guest line is Ted Purdy. Let me remind you about Ted's background. He's from Phoenix, Arizona, played his college golf at the University of Arizona, where he was a four time all pack 10 selection and a three time NCAA All-District Selection, and he was a third-team All-American in 1995. He, along with Jason Gord, Jim Furyk, and their other teammates, won the 1992 NCAA National Championship. Like I mentioned at the top of the show, he was a University of Arizona Academic Champion Award winner three years in a row from 1992 to 1994. In 95, Ted finished runner-up at the NCAA uh, National Championship, finished one stroke back of Auburn's Chip Spratlin. Ted was one of the top, has one of the top low 18 hole aggregates in Arizona history with his six under par 65 at the NCAA Western Regional and a low 54 hole to, total aggregate of 13 under par at the Ping Arizona Intercollegiate Tournament, which he won back in 1996. He beat Tiger Woods by six strokes at the 1996 Arizona Ping Invitational. He's played in more competitive rounds than anybody in the University of Arizona history. He was inducted into the Wildcat Hall of Fame back in 2005, turned pro in 96. In 97, he won the Asian Masters Championship and was named Rookie of the Year on the Asia PGA Tour. He's won once so far on the Web.com Tour at the 2003 First Tee Arkansas Classic and once on the PGA Tour at the 2005 Byron Nelson, uh, Byron Nelson Classic, and I'm very excited. He is back with me again tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Ted, thanks for coming back on the show. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. So, Ted, catch us me? up. What's been going on with you? Yeah, absolutely. Catch us up with what's going on with you this year. Well, I just, uh, you know, I, I kind of joined the show, as Andy was saying, what a great guy I am. But uh, I just want to say uh, Chris O'Connell and Andy Trainer at uh, Plain Truth Golf, they are top-notch guys themselves. So, um I thank Andy for the uh, compliment, but it goes both ways. They are they are class people for sure. So talk um, about that. Well, talk about the work that you're doing, putting in uh, with working with those guys. Well, so I was, uh, you know, there's uh, no secret anyway for the people around me that uh, I've been struggling with my golf game, and I was standing on the uh, driving range at the Wyndham Championship. And I kept, my ball kept hitting the left 
screen at the uh, driving range because I was hitting these nasty hooks. And um, my good friend, Matt Kutcher, came over to me and said, Purdy, come here. And he goes, here's Chris's phone number. Call him. So um, obviously Chris knew, you know, historically I was a very good ball striker. I, I hit, uh, you know, uh, one of the top in total driving where I hit it straight and long. And I, um, I think the final round at the Byron Nelson that I won, I hit all 18 greens on Sunday. Um, so I was a very consistent ball striker, and, but my game had gotten off and I couldn't figure out how it or why it had gotten off. And, um, Kutcher gave me Chris O'Connell's card and to give him a call. And I called Chris from the driving range and Chris says, well, send me a, a video of, uh, of, you know, what, what you're doing. And, um, uh, I had my caddy take a video. We emailed it to him or, you know, I texted it to him and then he responded instantly. And he, um, you know, he gave me a, a tip. He said, when you get it to the top of the backswing, throw the club head with your right hand as hard as you can throw it and see where the ball goes. And I, I get it to the top and I just said, you know, I'm just going to do what Chris says because I'm lost. I don't know. I'm going to lose my card anyway. It's the last tournament. I'm not, there's, unless I win, I'm not getting into the FedEx Cup. And, uh, and the first swing, the ball went dead straight. And I was like, well, this is still, and it felt really great. It felt natural. It felt amazing. And, um, I ended up missing the cut that week. And Friday night, I called my wife and I said, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to Long Island to see Chris O'Connell at Friarhead. That's where he coaches during the summer. And, and I want to spend the weekend with Chris. And my wife said, yeah, for sure. Go. I mean, you're a miserable wreck. And ever since that, that time last, uh, I haven't had any opportunities to uh, show it off, but, um, that was about two years ago. My swing is, has never been better. Um, I'm playing a lot more and, uh, I'm loving the game again. And it, it's all because of, uh, Andy Trainer and Chris O'Connell. So, um, anyway, that's what's, uh, that's what's happened over there with, uh, Chris and Andy. So, Ted, um, saying, and I'm, speaking just, of, I'm just so, waiting for, I'm just waiting for that. No, go ahead. Yeah. No, that's it. So that's, that's the question, right? That's, when are we going to get the opportunity to see, you know, how well your game has progressed? I was I was hoping you were going to be in the Barbasol Championship this week, but um, when is the next opportunity we might see you out there? Yeah, I mean, uh, historically, or last year I got in uh, without any problems. Um, this year, because they, they shuffled the schedule, they moved the majors, they moved the PGA to a different date, um, the, the veteran members have had – fewer opportunities to play this year. Um, so unfortunately I'm not in the, uh, Barbersaw this weekend. Um, and there, you know, there are a lot of great veteran players that, that aren't playing, um, just because I think of the schedule change this year with the, they, they, they're moving all the majors into, um, you know, a, basically a two month, two month period. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, Unfortunately, for an older player like myself, I'm 46 years old. Um, when they took tour school away from us, it really limited the opportunity for the older player to keep playing on the PGA Tour because it's, you know, the, the web.com is very, ex- or the, whatever the new name of the tour is, the old web.com tour. It's very expensive to travel. It's very expensive to play. The financial rewards aren't there to pay the bills. And when you're an older player with kids and a mortgage and, um, you know, college tuition coming up and that type of thing, it's hard for the older player to play that, that tour to get back on, on the PGA tour, um, because of our financial commitments at home. Um, the average age on the PGA tour has gone down. I think it's a stat that's well publicized went from 35 years old and now it's closer to 28 which is a huge uh, percentage decline in the age of guys on the pga tour and 
you know, the argument is, well, the younger players are better. Um, and my argument is, you know, Matt Kuchers is winning out there and, uh, we've had several 40 plus year olds do amazing on the PGA tour this year. My argument is that it's the, the financial structure of the tour now with that, when you took tour school away from, from us, from the ability to, to get back on the PGA tour through a one week period to a full year period, um, it really kind of knocked the older player financially out of the, out of the picture. Um, especially if people that have kids and, and want to see their kids. Um, so, so at 46 years old, is the focus now to keep your game as sharp as, as you can and, you know, look ahead to the champions tour or is that too far of a gap to, to be at, at this point? You still got four years to go. Well, no, the, I mean, obviously the goal is I'm still playing golf every day. I'm still working with Chris and, and Andy trainer, um, Chris O'Connell. The goal is still to play on the PGA tour. It's just when I get the opportunity, I'd be very ready. Um, because I'm a past champion, a uh, veteran member of the tour, I'll get an opportunity eventually. Um, just not sure when that'll be. I thought for sure it'd be the Barbersaw, um, this week, but I'm, uh, 10th alternate and it doesn't look like I'm going to get in. Um, but yeah, I mean, the goal is to stay sharp and be ready. And, uh, fortunately, the, the, uh, the veteran members of the PGA tour were smart and they built, you know, and we've got a great board with Charles Schwab on our board. And, um, the people that came in front of me really thought this, uh, our profession out and they created a pension system for the, the PGA tour players, um, which is an amazing, uh, I think we have the best pension in sports. Um, the FedEx cut money that we earn, uh, goes into our pension. Um, so fortunately I, when I turned 45, my, and I wasn't playing full time on the PGA tour. My pension kicked in and it enabled me to, uh, support my family and, uh, keep doing, keep, you know, the pursuit alive uh, as a professional golfer. But that, that's all from the foresight of the, of the smart people and, you know, the Tim Pensions and the, the, uh, smart directors that we had on the PGA tour to create a system that enabled the older player to, and that, you know, in, in a, at 50, I've got the opportunity to make, uh, or compete again on the PGA or PGA champions tour. Um, you know, I'm just in the, uh, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I, I, I tell everybody I'm living the dream. I, uh, I'm a professional golfer and, and fortunately professional golfers kind of take care of them of each other. And, um, they've created an amazing system for, for us to compete. You know, I, I can, I, I uh, complain about the fact that we can't get back on Q school because it'd be nice to go, you know, give it all I, all I got one week. I finished in the top 25. I'm back on the PGA tour. Um, and when they took that away from us, that, that kind of knocked the older player, well, knocked the incentives for the older player to keep, keep uh, chasing the, the, the web.com or the former web.com tour. Um, but no, I'm the luckiest guy in the world for sure. Ted, I, I, I enjoyed, I, I enjoyed seeing a picture of you out on social media with Alice Cooper earlier this year. What was it like, uh, chatting with Alice Cooper? Well, Alice and I have known each other for a lot of years. Well, as everybody knows, he's an avid golfer and he grew up in Phoenix, Arizona and I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. And Alice is tied into every golfer in town. Um, so. Uh, anybody that plays golf in Phoenix, Arizona has played golf with Alice Cooper. He's just a great, he's an amazing guy. He's an amazing Christian. He's got an amazing foundation, um, that we all support, uh, the Solid Rock Foundation. Um, uh, he's, he's saving the kids, the, 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 the kids that are in need in Arizona. Uh, Alice Cooper's really, uh, really doing his part to get, make them, uh, giving them a place to go, giving them support, counseling, 
teaching him how to play the guitar. Um, when Alice is in town, he's regularly at his facility in Solid Rock Foundation. Um, yeah, Alice Cooper is a special human being and, uh, we're lucky to have him and lucky to have him as a part of our community in Phoenix. Ted, with it being Open Championship Week, you got to play in a couple of Open Championships back in 05 and 06 at St. Andrews and Royal Liverpool. Talk about what it's like. What's the experience like being a part of an Open Championship, particularly at the home of golf and at St. Andrews? Well, again, I'm one of the luckiest guys in the world. Uh, in 2005, my uh, corporate sponsor is Herb Kohler, the Kohler Plumbing Company. And... um I'm I'm playing the John Deere and Herb Kohler calls me and he says, Ted, I've got, I'm going to come pick you up in Moline, Illinois from Kohler, Wisconsin. And I'm going to take you to the British Open at St. Andrews in 2005. Um, and it just had turned out that six months earlier, he had bought the old course hotel, the Kohler company and, and Herb had bought the old course hotel and totally renovated it and got it ready for the open. And, uh, my sponsor has me, my family, my, my father on a, a G550 that her bones. And, uh, I hit my last putt of the John Deere Classic. We got in the car. We went to the airport. Herb was standing at the top of the staircase waving at us. We got up, um, we all went to bed. And when I woke up, I was in, uh, in St. Andrews, uh, at the old course hotel. Um, so that, that alone was an amazing experience, uh, being a part of her Kohler and his old course hotel. Um, but yeah, playing in 2005, it was Jack Nicholas's last British open. It was, you know, when every picture that you see where he's standing on the, on the bridge on 18 waving, that was, that was the year. Well, in, in London and, you know, the, or in Britain that year, they said, well, we're going to make a five pound note with Jack's picture on it. So all the players could buy as many five pound notes as they wanted. When we checked in, how many five pound notes you want? Well, Jack was around all the time and he was signing everybody's five pound notes. And then when we went to the memorial the, the following year, um, Everybody had Jack sign their five pound note. So, I mean, we've got, I've got a, a framed five pound note signed by Jack Nicholas and I've got my medallion from the 2005 British Open in a frame. And it's one of my cherished items. It's, uh, it's pretty spectacular. I didn't play, I so, made the cut that year and I finished about 70th, but so the, my golf was stinky, but I've got that memorabilia that that uh, that was pretty special. Talk about it, the preparation. So it sounds like you had almost no preparation for that event. You're on a plane. The next thing you know, you're there. The next thing you know, you're you're starting off on the in the Open Championship. Was were you prepared for the tournament? What was it like trying just to get ready to play in an event like that? Oh, well, it, it's no different than any other tournament. I mean, we, we fly in um, every event on the PGA Tour. We fly in. Sunday night, we, we, we get done with the event. So the, the guys that finished, uh, at the John Deere, uh, Sunday night, two nights ago, or three nights ago, they had a chartered plane from the John Deere to the British Open. Well, there's, you know, 50 players that are playing in the John Deere that are going to play the British Open. Well, we land, you know, Monday morning, we get in our hotel, we, kind of decompress. Some of the guys might go to the golf course on Monday. Um, but in a, uh, it's, it's no different from any other player. We're, on Tuesday, we, we do our practice round. Wednesday, we have a practice round. Um, we work with our sports psychologists. We work with our coaches. We work with, you know, our trainers. We do, uh, everybody's got their, their routine. And then you play the golf tournament. But a major is, you know, it, it's, a bigger event it's more uh obviously prestigious there's more energy there's more people there's more it, but it, i don't think any most players just have their routine no matter what the event is um i know 
a lot of players like to go to the you know golf course if it's a major, especially Tiger and Phil and the and the the guys that have won lots of majors. They might go a month ahead of time and they might spend a week there and get their you know agronomists out there and the their laser pointers out and whatever. But um, but for the average guy is you know we we finish Sunday night from the John Deere we get on a, a charter that the PGA Tour, the John Deere, and the British Open set up for us, um, and then they fly us to the next event, and it, we start all over again. And then there'll, there'll be a charter Sunday night from the British Open back to the Canadian Open. So the guys that finish uh, late Sunday night will get on the plane, British Open, and then uh, you know get ready to compete for Thursday in the Canadian Open. So that's uh, that's kind of the routine we have, and it, you know it's a bigger event, but um, it's pretty much the same routine with, with every event. Is it a different mindset when you're over there? Because now it's Lynx golf course, right? I mean, this is Lynx style play, so it's not exactly the same as you know, sort of the air game that we play here in the states. Do you have to switch your mind frame and your strategy around, or is it not as big a deal to? to go play that kind of a link style golf course as uh, someone like me might think it is. No, I, I agree with you. I think it's a totally different game. Um, you have to be a little more creative around the greens. You have to, so the, the second uh, British open I played was uh, at Royal Liverpool. And that golf course was interesting because they had these uh, pot bunkers in the, basically in the fairway, they had them all over the golf course, but it forced the golfers to pretty much hit. It didn't, you know, if you had to hit it a hundred and you had to hit it 260 yards to that spot in the fairway. If you tried to challenge it, you'd end up in a hole and you'd have to chip out and, or you'd be in Heather. And so everybody in 2006 had to, had to be in the same spot in the fairway. Well, that meant driver didn't matter. You know, it's whatever you hit 260 yards in a certain spot in that fairway. Well, Tiger was in the same spot in the fairway that I was. Chris DeMarco was in the same spot in the fairway that I was. Ernie Els, Sergio, everybody was in the same spot in the fairway. Well, Tiger wins that week, and it had nothing to do with his driver. Um, and that's kind of like – I say that a lot when I get clinics and things. Is, is, is Everybody thinks that, and Tiger was, in my opinion, the longest player on tour. Bubba Watson will say he's the longest player on tour. But at the 2006 British Open, he beat us, beat us all from the same place in the fairway. So it had nothing to do with his driver. Um, and it had to do with his ability to hit a second shot on the green and then make the putt and to manage his way around the course. And, um, and Link style golf, there's, there's a, definitely a lot more getting involved. Uh, maybe not at St. Andrews where you just pound it left. You know, you just every hole you pound it left and, and you'll be able to play the hole. But um, but most of the Lynx now courses, if you, you really kind of, it's it's more like chess than it is, um, uh, you know, hit it high and let it fly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely different. The other thing is that the greens are slower. So they, because of the wind, they, the, the, the greens that the, um, at the Masters are, are running 12, 13 on the step meter. They just, you tap them and they just go, go, go. Well, when you have greens that fast with wind, um, they have to call the rounds because the wind will literally blow the ball off the green if there's no friction on the green. So in Link style golf, the greens are, are running more like eight or nine on the step meter. Well, a guy from the States who just came from the John Deere, or just came from um, another tournament on the PGA Tour where the greens are absolutely perfect, running like glass, beautiful. They get, they come to the British Open and now you're, the greens running eight. Well, you know, you, you have to adjust your, your, how hard you hit the ball. And, and your natural instinct is to, you see downhill and you hit it soft and you end up leaving it way short. So yeah, there is a lot of adjustment that that comes into playing a link style British Open course for sure. Talk about weather and in, in, in 2005 and 2006, did you have to deal with 
the high winds and the and the rain and sometimes the sideways rain that we uh, get so accustomed to seeing during an open championship? Uh, well, um, I, you know, guys growing up in Phoenix, Arizona, I'm not used to wind or clouds for that matter. And when <laughs> I showed up to the <laughs> British Open, um, I was expecting, you know, I brought all the my my rain gear, I brought all my gear, and we're staying at the Old Course Hotel, and it turns out the weather is 80 degrees and sunny every day. <laughs> wow! And they had no wow. they had no AC they had no AC in the in the Old Course Hotel because it's never like that. And um, um, we were actually hot and sweaty in the hotel room, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> The 2005 was a really freak year. So uh, in 2006, we got some wind, we got some rain, and uh, we were back to normal in 2006. But uh, my St. Andrews uh, experience was was like it was like heaven. I mean, I literally thought I was in heaven when I was in Herb Kohler's hotel at St. Andrews, watching Jack Nicholas wave at us. I mean, it, it couldn't have got better. Ted, just a couple more before I let you go. And, you know, first of all, you know, you've mentioned Tiger Woods a couple of times. You're a guy who stared down Tiger a couple of times in your college career, beat him by six strokes at the 96 Arizona Ping Invitational. What was it like, uh, you know, sort of week in and week out competing against Tiger and and getting the best of him once or twice? Well, uh, I got Tiger once or twice. He got me every other time. We'll just put it that way. He is, he is, in my opinion, the greatest golfer on the planet, maybe the greatest golfer ever to live. Um, so Noda Begay, we're all the same age. Uh, Noda and I, Noda Begay won four times on the PGA Tour. He's never beaten Tiger in a tournament. In college or in junior golf or in, on the PGA Tour, when Tiger was in the field and Noda was in the field, Tiger always beat him. So <laughs> that's a stat I'm sure Noda doesn't want shared with everybody. But he <laughs> lived. <laughs> and, and, and Noda won four times on the PGA Tour. I, luckily, Tiger was in the field when I won the Byron Nelson. So I took him down on the PGA Tour, too. So that's I've always got that on Noda. <laughs> and I remind him of that. <laughs> That's but great. Tiger is just a phen- phenomenal player. He's just uh, and a great guy. Um, he obviously had his troubles in the media, uh, but he he does have guys on the tour that love him and support him, and and he's made all of us a ton of money, um, and we are completely and utterly grateful for for everything that Tiger's done for the game of golf, for the guys on the PGA Tour, and. Um, he's just an amazing, amazing guy, amazing golfer. So before I let you go, Ted, I got to get your thoughts on the Open Championship this week. Who do you like? Who do you think's at top of the leaderboard uh, come uh, come Sunday afternoon? Well, I got to go with my man Kutcher because uh, Chris O'Connell and and Andy Trainer and uh, the Plain Truth. We've got to get Kutcher a, a major and. I think he's ready. He's number one in the FedEx Cup, I believe, and um, he's having yep. an amazing year. And it's good to be, let's, let's get the old guy, the old guy to the to the finish line. Ted, let our listeners know how they can stay up to date and follow you, whether it's uh, checking out your website tedperdy.com or giving you a follow on social media as well. Well, I've got a, a Twitter account, uh, Ted Purdy. Um, Instagram is Purdy Ted. Um, you know, hopefully they see me soon back on the PGA Tour. Well, Ted, thank you so much for being generous with your time and, and coming back and be a part of the show again tonight. Always enjoyable listening to your stories and your insights, and uh, I sure hope you'll come back and join me again real soon. Well, anytime you invite me, I'll be back. Ted, take Thanks care, my friend. Me. All the best to you and your family. We'll catch up soon. Thank you. That's Ted Purdy, P-U-R-D-Y, at Ted Purdy. You can find him on Twitter at Purdy Ted on Instagram. And uh, again, a guy who stared down Tiger a handful of times in college and obviously got him once on the PGA Tour as well. And then uh, some really great stories. I'm hoping everything that he's doing with uh, Chris O'Connell and Andy Trainer has gotten him 
not only back just uh, feeling good about his golf game, but uh, hopefully he gets to show it off here real soon before he has to wait four years to get out back on the Champions Tour, but uh, hopefully gets an opportunity on the PGA Tour again real soon. All right, folks, time for me to put a bow on this episode of Next on the Tee. I want to send out my sincere thank you to Chris Sheehan, Andy Trainer, and Ted Purdy for joining me tonight. Please check out our website, nextonthetee.net. There you'll be able to keep track of our guest schedule, so you'll be able to see who we've got coming on the show. Please also check us out. We're available on a newer, newer website, launchpaddm.com. So you can go on there and you uh, can listen to, You know, I think we've got about 110 of our uh, over 300 episodes available for you on there. Click the subscribe button. We'd really appreciate uh, you doing that. You can also stream us on a number of other great sites, places like Podbean, who we can't thank enough for always being really good to us. Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audioboom, Player.fm. We're all over the net. So if you've got a favorite uh, podcasting site or a podcasting app that you uh, click on on your, uh, on your mobile phone, you'll find us on there as well. Please also check out uh, the page on uh, Facebook, uh, Next on the Tea with Chris Mascaro. Share your feedback with me there. I'd really appreciate it. Folks, I can't thank you enough for choosing to listen to this show tonight. We know you got a lot of great golf podcasts and content out there available to you. We certainly appreciate the fact that you are making us a part of it. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. You've been listening to Next on the G with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA pros and top instructors and media members go to tell their stories. Join us the same time every Tuesday to hear more stories about the game we love from people who love sharing those stories with you. It's all about the great game of golf. It's all